Jamaica has the second highest murder rate in the world. The second highest murder rate in the world. And we have the second highest rate of femicide in the world. That's a killing of women. Right now you know we are unstoppable. Unstoppable, that means they can't stop you. You unstoppable, now we are trained. What I want again, unstoppable family. So people, the topic is still crime in Jamaica. Some people feel them have the answers. Some people still are trying to figure it out. Well, Lisa Anna is right here right now having a conversation about it. And she's breaking it down to the dollar. You know, talking about how much crime costs Jamaica. She had talked about that amongst other things. Viewers, let's take a listen to what Lisa Anna is saying right here. Wanted to talk to you about something. Something that is still troubling me deeply. And because there's so much things... So many things going on, especially in the Caribbean. Sometimes we have a tendency in Jamaica, we call it a nine day wonder. And sometimes we have a tendency to continue to look at the things that are popular rather than really drill down and look at the things that are affecting us deeply. And that's, I want to talk to you a little bit about how I'm feeling about crime and violence. Those of you who follow me would have seen that I did a part one about an undeclared war an unrecognizable and undeclared war in Jamaica, Jamaica's real pandemic. Because, and that was part one, which was last week, because two weeks ago, on November 20th, 12 Jamaicans were murdered in one day. That's 12 nameless, faceless people who have gone on to just be a statistic, all under 41 years old. And that's troubling for many reasons, because their families are affected, their loved ones are affected, their friends are affected, and somehow we just keep continuing to move on. One of the unfortunate things that are ha that's happening is that between January of last year, of this year, January 1, 2021, to November 30th, 2021, 5,429 Jamaicans have been affected by crime and violence. That's 17 persons per day. So on any given day, four Jamaicans or four persons will be murdered in Jamaica. Three will be shot, one will be raped, three will experience a break-in. And you can go back and swipe to see um, some of the other statistics that are there. Now, what is happening is that Jamaica has the second highest murder rate in the world. The second highest murder rate in the world. And we have the second highest rate of femicide in the world. That's a killing of women. Now, the WHO actually says if you, are, if you have an epidemic, that's 10 people who die per 100,000. Jamaica actually has 13 women who are murdered per 100,000. And that is actually some serious things. And I, I really want you to, to, to let that sink in. Dr. Herbert Gale at the University of the West Indies presented last in 2019 at a crime summit that the opposition actually had. And it was a multi-sectoral um, crime summit with the private sector organization, other government officials, etc. And one of the things that he said that jolted me is that 53% of all persons who commit murder in this country say that they were tortured by their mothers. In other words, how their mothers loved them, how they treated them, how they felt abused. And within that statistic, 75% of those persons who had killed twice were tortured by their mothers. And, and those who had killed even multiple times and women say that they had a real angst against their mothers. I remember when I was Minister of Youth and Culture and I led a team. I wasn't responsible for children um, in remand centers, but I led a team with psychiatrists and I went to go and look for the girls at um, Fort Augusta who were being held. We subsequently took them and, and, and separated them from adults, but there was one little girl that still stays with me. She was 13 years old and she was incarcerated for uncontrollable behavior. Yes parents actually take their children to the police station that says that they can't control them. This little girl was sucking her finger, resting her head on my shoulder, falling asleep while I was talking to the other young women. And all of a sudden, she jumped up. Miss, you know, I said, I'm kill my mother though. And I said, but why would you want to kill your mother? And she was very graphic about how she was going to do it because she felt her mother did not love her. All the mother did was tell her how awful she was, uh, beat her every day, didn't, she didn't feel she was loved. And she felt also that it was her mother who took her and locked her up. But it goes on because what you find is that 
when you look even closer at the data, and that data exists for everybody to see it, 18% of our population right now in Jamaica between the ages of 15 to 34 years old are male. 75% of all murder that was committed in, in 2020 was committed by this age group. So if, if we're really focusing on crime and looking at what is happening, you will find that we really have to focus on, on addressing this segment of our population. Something has gone wrong with our, with our men because 80% even of this, these kinds of murders are gang related. So today, um, I felt I needed to even dig even deeper because one of the benchmarks that declares, or when a country is going through civil war, is how many murders you commit by 100,000. So for a civil war, the international benchmark is 30 murders per, or 30 deaths per 100,000 if you are going out there to slaughter people. Right now, Jamaica is at 46.2, 46.2. Um, let that sink in a little bit. And now crime actually costs Jamaica 5% of GDP, what, or gross domestic product. And what, what is that? that what, what is that figure? That's $100 billion. $100 billion works out in our population to $39,000 per person. Now imagine what you could do with an extra $100 billion in Jamaica. What kind of schools you could build, your healthcare systems. But the reason why we're not having that money is because we're missing investments. Nobody wants to invest. I actually saw a comment on the article today that somebody wants to invest in Jamaica, but because of crime, they're not going to do it. And people are retiring in other countries. So because of the levels of violence, the high levels of violence that we have, people are not investing in Jamaica and we're missing out deeply, and they're taking their resources to other countries. Even Jamaicans are not, don't want to open businesses later. Now here is, here is the, a fundamental problem, and people allude to it, but when you look at former um, PSOJ, private sector organization of Jamaica president, Howard Mitchell actually says, look, the private sector is prepared to fund um, any kind of crime fighting mechanism in this country. But the problem is they want to see um, the kind of bipartisan, nonpartisan approach between government and opposition and a multi-sectoral approach that also includes social interventions. And that whatever is put in place in the medium to long term, because crime is not going to be fixed overnight, is that any government or administration that comes into power, it cannot be changed. And that crime fighting should not be a political crime, um, political scoring mechanism to score political points on any political platforms or for any political party. Mark Golding, the opposition leader, has said, look, let's start back the Vail Royal talks. Let's get together. We, the opposition does not agree with temporary states of emergencies because it robs people of their basic human rights, but also it, it doesn't help to solve crime, right? Because it takes away the police investigative mechanisms. So you need other medium-term to long-term um, Strategies. In addition to that, you need social intervention programs like the Peace Management Initiative to be stronger and unite for change. Problem is, um, our Minister of National Security and Dr. Horace Chang is, is, has said, look, in his years, he has seen over administration to administration, and he uses St. James as an example, that with all the social intervention programs that are there, crime and murder has not really gone down. And he uses St. James as a, as a parish. So he doesn't think that they have actually worked because in 1997, murders in St. James or crime was, was um, 12 per 100,000. It's now up to 100, over 180, approximately 180 per 100,000. So what he's saying is, look, the only time he has seen crime murders come down and crime come down in St. James is with the states of emergencies. No. How, how, how will we solve crime and violence? How will we come together? Because if, if, if you have the opposition and the government disagreeing with such divergent positions, then we have to find a mechanism to move forward. The data also suggests, those who have done the research, is that from the 1970s, all the major operation anti-crime programs have failed. Kingfish, ACID, Echo Squad, Operation Ranger, Operation Intrepid, 
have all failed to, to really solve and curtail the crime, or the, certainly the murders coming down. So what Carl Stone, even from the 1970s, have said, hey, look, until you bridge the marginalization in this country and the social inequality, you will always have crime. You will always have violence when people feel that they're marginalized and when you have poverty. So we have to figure out a way to erase that marginalization and with equality. That's, that's not rocket science. And those of you who, who speak to people who are on the periphery and on the fringes of, of their daily lives, you feel the resentment because many people who turn to a life of crime will actually tell you, look, I'm just a try to feed the family. No. Here is something interesting. Um, in 1989 in the United States, crime was at its highest level ever, right? And then all of a sudden in the 1990s, it started to fall and criminologists were startled. They couldn't figure it out. And then experts said, well, you know, guess what? We have better policing, police reforms, the crack and different drug markets have changed and they went on and on and on. There were two economists who said, hang on a minute, um, something isn't right here because there is no real direct correlation. I'm using one of them because one of the arguments was that the economy was stronger in the 1990s. And what they said was, look, in the 1960s, even with a stronger economy, crime was, violent crime was, was surging as well. And even in the 1990s, when unemployment went down by 2%, crime was falling by 40%. So they said there's really, they can't see the correlation between the stronger economy. And they went to, to, to look at different things. The two economists are Steve Levitz and Stephen um, Dubnow. You can go and look them up. Then, when they looked a little deeper, they found something that they, they, they credited for the reduction of crime in the 1990s. And this was a controversial revelation that they came up with, and because the data supported it. It was one single decision. That single decision in 1973 was Roe versus Wade, giving women the ability to have legal abortions. Now, I know some of you will probably come off of this live and say, look, Lisa, we're not listening to it. I can't believe we went in this direction. But the data doesn't lie, because right after that was, was passed, 750,000 women who felt that they could not care for a child um, had a legal abortion because what the economists saw was that it was only middle class and upper class women who could afford it and that women who were in abject poverty, generational poverty, their children would turn to a life of crime. So by that time, by 1980, they had 750,000 women who could legally afford to say, look, I can't do this. And by, um, when Roe versus Wade came out, and by 1980, it was 1 1.6 million people. That was one in every four women who were now choosing not to go forward and have a child that they could not take care of. Now, it's the data. It sounds, it is controversial. But imagine in a country at that time, of 225 million people at that time, where 1.6 million women said, look, we cannot go forward with this situation. And 1.6 million people, children, women, were no longer birthing children they could not afford. No, crime will not be solved overnight in Jamaica. It won't. But we have enough crime-fighting plans that exist. Enough summits have been done. Enough papers have been written. They all exist. They're there. What you need is to make sure that people's human rights are, are protected. What you also need is to make sure that we have the social intervention programs which exist and they need to be funded with adequate budgets. But I strongly believe, apart from the multi-sectoral, non-partisan thing, you have to include women in your long-term crime fighting plan. Women to give them parenting skills, coping mechanisms, because if you accept the data that is proven data coming out of the University of the West Indies that look, repeat killers said that they were tortured by their mothers. We also have to look at our mothers as a part of this crime fighting mechanism and talk to them, ask them what their struggles are, ask them what their maternal health um, choices are, ask them when they go to the public sector, like in my constituency with a woman with seven children and every time she goes and she wants to have her tubes tied, the nurse says, where's your husband? 
or where is, you're too young to have your tubes tied. These are some things that we fundamentally have to start thinking of outside the box if we really want to talk and to, to solve it because women have to also be included and we have to start giving women the right to maternal choices, parenting choices, and the right to choose if we are going to move forward and see what happens in this country. So thank you for listening. That I felt strongly I needed to come on this morning, uh, this afternoon and talk to you. And I hope I gave you some food for thought. All right, big up. Um, you can go and read the articles. Click the, click the link in my bio and you can, you can read both of them and you can get the data there and have the discussions because if nothing else, if nothing else as a country, we have to start talking to each other about solutions. Don't just click a comment because you want to just click a comment. Let's start having meaningful discussions about presenting solutions forward. We might not all agree with everything everybody says, but sometimes change happens because we have agreed to sit and listen to one another. So have a great Sunday. Um, whatever you do, please keep safe in this pandemic. Lots of love. Bless you. Well, all right, there you have it, Unstoppable Family. What is your take? What is your opinion on what Lisa Hanna had to say right here? What would I love to hear from you in the comment section? Talk to me. I will definitely be reading your comments, and as long as it makes sense, I will definitely respond. All right? This has been another one from Unstoppable TV. Like, share, comment, and definitely, if this is your first time and you have not yet hit that subscribe button, please consider hitting the subscribe button now. Turn on all notifications. Once you upload a video, you will get notified. No matter what, don't make nobody stop you. I'm unstoppable and I'm out. Right now, you know we're unstoppable. Unstoppable.